Alright, we're back to the Melon series, and I promise this episode isn't all spent on the Cactus Farm. In fact, we won't be touching the Cactus Farm much in this episode. I've got other plans, but who knows, that may change. There was a squid trapped under some ice, luckily for him I was around to help, because we all know squids need to breathe fresh air to survive, right? If you watched the last video, you can see I'm continuing where I left things off collecting ice. For building an ice road from the base to the cactus farm, before you say anything, building a road to the cactus farm doesn't count as working on the cactus farm. Calm yourselves. I was trying out a new technique for placing ice blocks. Rather than hold shift and place blocks at a snail's pace, I'm attempting to walk backwards at a normal pace while quickly placing the ice. I fell off a few times. Day 302, the sun was up and I was back collecting ice. I'll be honest, it was kind of jarring seeing the snowy biome, whatever it's called, next to a sunny plains biome. It's a weird juxtaposition my mind was having trouble grasping. Made worse by the polar bears enjoying the warmer climate of the plains biome. I was half expecting David Attenborough to jump out of nowhere and begin narrating the natural marvel. The polar bear, this solitary predator, has been pushed to the brink of extinction and its habitat. Forced to mingle with common livestock, it goes about its day conserving energy as it tries to get through the relentless summer heat. The livestock may provide a convenient meal, but it will have to work for it. Farmers roam these lands and are protective of their livestock. For this female polar bear in particular, it's been two weeks since her last meal. If she doesn't eat soon, she is surely starved to death. Anyway, once my inventory was full, I was back working on the ice road and was starting to get the hang of the old backwards block placing technique. The only issue, besides falling off the side, are spawning mobs. None of the ice is lit, and so mobs can still spawn. Disconcerting when you're walking backwards. Day 303. I found another issue with the quick building backwards method, or as I like to call it, the QBBM, and that's lag. Albeit, my computer only lagged ever so slightly here and there, but it was enough to keep causing me to fall off the side. Or at least, that's what I'm saying is the reason, and I'm sticking to it. After my ice ran out, I went over what I'd done so far and removed any double ice blocks I'd accidentally put down. After, I did a bit of pickaxe repairing at the mob spawner, not much because I didn't have the time, but it was something. And just before the night came to an end, I slept so phantoms wouldn't spawn for the next few nights. Day 304, I was feeling good after my sleep. My muscles felt rested and pumped to be put back to use swinging my pickaxe around, gathering hundreds if not thousands of ice blocks. I even lost track of time and stayed through a portion of the night. Only for a bit, the ice road was cooling. I had a feeling tomorrow would be the last day of ice collecting. I should have enough to finish the road. And so when the next day began, I got back to work collecting blocks. It's such a therapeutic exercise, so much more relaxing than real life manual labour. The final part of the day was spent up at the spawner fixing my pickaxe. Sometimes in life, you have to be the bad guy, but not here. I was the good guy. He offered me pumpkin seeds, got what he deserved. Day 306, all the ice had been gathered. No phantoms would be spawning tonight and still using the QBBM method, I wasn't going to come away until the ice was all in place. Obviously, when night came, I slowed down with killing mobs. Unintentionally, I got a sniper achievement for killing a skeleton from far away. What can I say? It comes naturally. Day 307, I did it. I got all the ice blocks in place. Was that the road finished? No. I needed blocks along either side of the road to act as barriers so I don't slide off the side. And what better choice than an injection of melon? Melon placing was a breeze. I was flying through them at a pace only known to Hermes. Though I'm sure you'd expect no less. I'm a guy who knows his way around a melon. By day 309, one side of the road was complete, with melon barrier in place. I was going to get on with starting on the other side of the road, but I got distracted by my cactus farm. It looked great. I was thoroughly and objectively distracted, and loved every second of being. I'm still considering making it larger. I don't need to. It would simply be to flex. The next day, even with my top tier Hermes speed, there was a lot of ground to cover and a lot of melons to place, so I wasn't surprised when I ran out of those melons. And it's not just a case of going to the local shop and buying more, no, because I'm my own supplier, my own man. I get down and dirty with my hands, meaning only one thing, I was back to farming melons. And that continued for all of day 311. And I don't resent that fact, in fact, I enjoyed it. It's a nice reminder of where I've come from. As a great farmer once told me, never forget your 
your roots or seeds. Day 312, armed with the freshest, juiciest melons known to mortal man, I was back to work on the road and brimming with confidence I'd finished that road. Look, you can witness for yourselves the last melon going into place. And that, my friends and loyal subscribers, is a complete road. Complete as in functional. Technically, it's not fully finished because I need to light it up to prevent mob spawns, but it is also complete because I can now boat at breakneck speeds without breaking my neck. I love Minecraft, but the laws of physics in this game still throw me off. I was 100% certain I was going to obliterate any mobs with my speed, but somehow they were able to defy Newton's law of motions. Once we have the torches in place, we won't have to worry about the science any longer. I don't have any torches, so we will have to worry about the science for now. That's involving us waiting for logs to have smelted down into charcoal. And that led me to have to go restock on fuel for the smelters. They'd ran dry. Day 313, I only had enough buckets to half fill the smelters. I also have an iron farm that is constantly pumping out iron, believe it or not. Why not make more? Up until now, I've been making multiple trips from here to the smelters in my house, carrying only what my inventory would allow. For whatever reason, it never occurred to me to bring shulkers so that I wouldn't have to do that. Just one trip and it's done. With the smelters refueled, I put every log I owned into cook, which would mean I'd have to replenish that wood, but I've got time while I wait for the smelters to work their wizardry. When the sun rose on day 314, I bet you're surprised to find that I spent most of it chopping trees. I stopped when it got dark, and rather than restock my wood choker with the day's haul as I'd planned, I instead put them all into the smelters, and then I didn't have much to do. In my 300 days video, I briefly worked on adding a third layer to my melon farm while I had time to kill in the base, and now, while I wait for the nights to pass, because I'm not going to sleep it away, I had that same time to kill again. Day 315 was basically a carbon copy of day 314. I chopped down trees with the intention of refilling my wood choker and this time I would be following through on that intention. As far as the melon farm is concerned, I wasn't committed to getting the third layer completed, my focus is on other things, but small bits of progress here and there when I have a little free time are going to add up and I'll thank myself later. The majority of the logs in the smelter still needed to cook, but there were still a few stacks of charcoal I could turn into torches, and it was enough that I was able to light up the road. It took all day because it was so long. There were mobs to deal with, but it was satisfying this would be the last night I'd ever have to see them up here, because progress was still quick enough to get the road fully lit before the day was up. Early in the morning, seeing as I was at the desert, I glided down to the cactus farm to check on the cactus build-up. Good thing I did, because uh, two of the collection chests for two of the towers had stupidly been positioned in the wrong place, so cacti had been spilling out onto the floor and despawning. If this had been melons, my heart would have cracked then and there. You know, I'm all about quality of life additions, and that's why I placed a couple of double chests at both ends of the ice road, full to the brim of boats. It's all about convenience. At home, the smelting was coming to an end, and there were still buckets and buckets of lava needing to be used up. So in went a load of cobblestone, and I found myself with some free time again, so it was back to dirt placing at the melon farm. It may look like I'm going mad, but I'm doing something important, counting blocks to work out where I can start a melon staircase up to the mice road. I keep saying that I like the ice road because it's both quick and saves rockets, but I have to use four rockets to get up to the thing each time. Having a staircase that runs right up to it is going to be great. Once I'd figured out the starting point, it was just a case of staircasing all the way up to the road, and it was long enough that it took most of the day to put in place. And of course, get those temporary torches in place. We don't want mob spawns. Day 319, I was investigating. I'm always hearing zombies when I'm in the base. I've left it up until now because I thought they'd go away on their own, but they hadn't. It was a couple chilling together, no doubt on some romantic date, and here I came in like the Zodiac Killer to put an end to it. It was time for a change of scenery. I wanted to find a warped forest. I'm after warped stem, and luck was on my side. I found one almost immediately, which gave the opportunity to harvest warped stem logs all day. There was even a nether fortress in the area, a different one than the one I had already discovered. I didn't bother searching it, why would I? It's not like you can get melons from the thing. Day 320, it was time to head home. Going from tree to tree had left me a little bit disorientated from where I'd come from, but after a little flying around, I'd figured out where my lava collection point was, and from there, followed my staircase back to my portal. Again, I counted blocks, this time for a second staircase. I want more than one staircase up to the ice road. It means, however, that I'm going to need to transform this entire area to become a part of my base, which I say confidently is going to be a lot of work. 
and thinking ahead of all the work it will consist of, it's going to be on a behemoth scale. I was trying to stay away from large projects for a bit after our cactus farm from last video, but fuck it, if it needs doing, it needs doing. A man of melons can't shy away from hard work. It would need to wait until after I'd finished the staircases. I'm in the process of widening them both because my first staircase runs near to the pillager tower, I have to deal with angry pillagers who think I'm on their land. Little do they know, their time in this part of the world is coming to an end, and rightfully so. Day 322, this might seem like it's going against the melon way of life, but there's no way I'm using this staircase without stair blocks. It would take forever getting up to the road. The base of the entire staircase is made out of melons, so I still feel good about it. I mean, you have to agree, the colors go well together. That was one staircase. I still had the other to do. And I spent most of the day getting the stair blocks put in place. And I wasn't finished yet. I wanted additional melons on either side of the staircases. Not only for aesthetic reasons, but also for somewhere to put torches. You can't put them on stair blocks and it leaves the staircase dark at night, which I'm not having. Nothing exciting for day 324, it was taken up with the staircase. Day 325, pillagers are a real problem. Regardless of your opinion of firearms, these guys shouldn't have had them. Plainly, it would take more than that to take me down, but it still didn't make up for the fact they were annoying as hell. I got the last few torches placed the next day, and then it was time to go back to counting. Marking out the dimensions for the base expansion so the staircases feel like they're actually inside of the base rather than in a random spot away from the base. Unfortunately, those dimensions included a large cave. I was going to have a lot of work ahead of me. But mark my words, I'm not going to make the same mistake again when it comes to removing terrain. I have the resources to make a beacon, and I'm going to use it to its fullest potential. Obviously, a haste 2 beacon, otherwise what's the point? Day 327, I made a start removing the blocks needed for the base expansion. Even with a haste 2 beacon, it was going to take a while, but because we have a beacon, it will at least be smoother going than in the first 100 days of this series. Later on that same day, I had to stop because my pickaxe had already got too low on durability, and unfortunately, I've only got the one. So, I'm faced with a predicament. Continue with this lone pickaxe and keep returning to the mob spawner to repair it, or make additional backup picks like I did in my hardcore series and repair all of them in one go. While at the mob spawner I mauled it over weighing the pros and cons and to be frank, or juice, the latter option is clearly the play, to get more OP pickaxes. Filled with purpose I jumped off the side of the spawner and left the elytra gliding until the last minute. Two last minute, it wasn't an issue, my respawn point is at my house, so I didn't have far to travel to retrieve my belongings. Though I did have to search the area for a bit, turns out falling from the sky will explosively throw a person's items all over the place. That ominous life form bobbing on the surface of the water is discarded items I'd thrown off the side of the mob spawn a platform that I no longer want, or should I say didn't want. As if nothing had happened, I was back to the planned backup tools, buying a further three picks, three shovels and three axes from our sleep deprived toolsmith. Then woke the farmers to sell melons. I need money for further enchants. In the morning I kept busy while I waited for the farmers to reset their trades, so that I could sell even more melons to them for even more money. Going from rags to riches meant I could afford all of the enchanted books I needed for the three picks, which equated to a lot. And being the troublemaker I was, I punched an iron golem for fun. He didn't see the funny side of it, so I... I had to kill him, and accidentally misclicked after dealing the killing blow firing another arrow, killing one of the villagers. That enraged the other iron golems, so I had to kill them too, and sadly I couldn't push the blame onto an innocent villager, not when everyone had witnessed what had happened. So prices skyrocketed. Good thing I'd done all of my trading for the time being, so really I faced no consequences. Back up to the mob spawner, I combined all the books so they'd be ready to go onto my pickaxes. Day 330, I stuck those enchants onto my new backup picks, but then rather than head back to work removing the terrain as I'd been doing before with my single pick, I took our ice road to the desert. I needed sand, I'd smelted all of the blocks back at the base into glass, I needed more for making TNT. And why would one need TNT? for searching for ancient debris in the nether, of course. And as fine as I am strip mining for ancient debris, I know a lot of you watching aren't. After I uploaded my hardcore videos, I got a lot of upset messages for not having used TNT or beds. I'd managed to make some stacks of TNT, but I'd run out of gunpowder and had to head back to the base to restock. After I'd made the TNT, I repaired the shovel I'd used to collect the sand, and the final act of the day was taking a load of rotten flesh down to the villagers as a peace offering to see if they were still mad of me. 
they were, but their prices had come down a bit. Hopefully the good news of my sell and rotten body parts will get around and the prices come back down to normal. Before I headed into the nether I took out a potion of fire rest to keep in my hotbar and switched out my elytra for my chest plate. Inside the nether I mined down to y equals 15, mined out a small area for a tiny mining hub and found ancient debris immediately. I'd like to say a good omen. Before I could get the TNT placed I burrowed through the terrain like a fucking badger mole, placed the TNT and let it rip. That is exactly what I want to see. Ideally, I was after a minimum of 28 pieces of ancient debris. I say ideally like it's not going to happen, it will happen. I'm not leaving the nether until I've got at least that number. It wasn't until day 336 that I packed up and went home. I still had some TNT left over, but I'd gotten 43 pieces of ancient debris. There was no need to continue. Along with the two pieces of ancient debris I found earlier in the series, that's a total of 45 pieces, and they were turned into 11 netherite ingots. All of my tools went from diamond to netherite, including the three new backup pickaxes. I'd forgotten I had an OP hoe in the side of my ender chest. I upgraded that to netherite too. For the final part of the day I sold melons for the villagers. It looked like all had been forgiven, the prices were back to normal, I knew that rotten flesh from the other day would do the trick. Day 337 I farmed melons as an excuse to use my new netherite axes. Despite it performing exactly the same, it just lasts a bit longer which sometimes can go a long way. I stopped three quarters of the way through to trade with the villagers before the night was up. That entailed selling melons to the farmers and buying a lot of efficiency books from a librarian. The next day I finished farming for the rest of the melons and proceeded to sell a portion of them again in order to purchase the rest of the enchanted books I needed for the three backup shovels I brought back when I bought the three backup pickaxes. That's right, it's not just pickaxes I need, shovels are going to be just as important in renovating the terrain, thousands of dirt blocks stand in my way. After shoving the enchanted books onto my shovels, I transformed them from diamond to netherite with the three remaining netherite ingots we had left over, counted to perfection. I hadn't planned on sleeping, but after leaving my house, phantoms spawned instantly, and I couldn't be asked to put up with them. Day 340, I was collecting items for an enderman farm. My mob spawner has worked well, but as far as XP goes, if I'm going to be repairing multiple tools at a time, especially netherite tools, the mob spawner is not going to cut it. An enderman farm is the clear solution. It doesn't take long to make and it didn't take long to gather all of the items either. These are all of what I need. In the nether, I forgot which road led to the stronghold. I think it's this one. It was that one. Before I could start on the farm itself, I needed to get low in the world, so I put down a bucket of lava first, gave it time to fall to the bottom of the world, then used water to create a pillar of cobblestone where the lava had been. Even with an elytra on, it was nerve wracking being at the bottom of the world. Once I'd got the leaves in place, I could ladder up. It felt good to be putting distance between myself and the void. As far as this ladder is concerned, I doubt I'll ever actually use it. I did need to get close to the void again because the Enderman farm was getting built down there and for the next couple of days that's what I did. I'd have been able to build it in a single day but I was using a tutorial because I couldn't remember how to make one of those off by heart. and it was worth it. Look how much more XP I get from this than our mob spawner back at base. It didn't take long for all my levels to get into the mid 40s. I would have built it with melons if Endermen weren't able to pick them up and experience has taught me to be wary of them. Although a few people have mentioned that there is an Enderman farm design that incorporates melons, but 
I'm kind of curious about. Back in the overworld at the base, armed with a lot of elite level tools and a means to repair them quickly, I got back to work. This was going to take a lot of time. Good job, I've got a lot of time on my hands. Here's a look at some of the progress I've made. As you can see, a lot of blocks have been taken out and yet I've still got so many more to go. Most of this cave is going to have to be opened up because all of the blocks above my head are going to be needed to be removed and there's many layers of stone and dirt. Today, day 346, the focus was on putting in strips of melons across the area that my beacon's ability will reach. It's the same strategy I've done for the last two large areas I've cleared and it's for torch placement so light is evenly distributed throughout the cleared area and I can focus on nothing but removing blocks without the need to keep replacing torches I break on top of blocks I remove. Here's the strips that I've been able to put in. I haven't moved the torches onto them yet but they're in place. By the next day torches had been put onto the melon strips and the torches removed from anywhere else. A beacon's ability radius can only reach so far and it doesn't cover the entire area I'm wanting to remove. Rather than move my beacon yet, I want to keep working upwards until I've removed all of the blocks above to the open air outside. However, I'm nervous that if I do, I could drop down through the gaps in between the melon strips and the parts of the open cave and might die, so I'm going to fill it in. Although, if I had my elytra on, the danger of that happening is reduced by a lot. Regardless, I'd feel much better if I solidified the floor in on the parts of the open air than I can. I fell through at one point and had to run from creepers. Maybe another time and place this would have been bad, but for here and now, it was of little to no concern. It took a couple of days to fill in the gaps with melons, and half of it I was paranoid that a creeper was going to drop down behind me and explode. There were three areas I needed to fill out and I got all of them filled, so now my fear of falling through shouldn't come true. Day 350, it was time to make a start on all of the blocks above the space I'd renovated down here. I was stupidly opting for the mine up option. This would be sustainable only for so long. And it didn't take long to recognise this, which is why I changed strategies. I knew the dimensions of the area I'm wanting to renovate, so I simply towered up from the two far corners of the space up to the surface. These melons I'd towered up on would then act as visual guides guidelines. All I'd need to do was remove all the blocks that fell within that perimeter from the top down. And just to stop mobs from spawning up here on the surface so I could continue work during the night, I ran around placing torches. Day 351, the day of reckoning had come. I'd been licking my chops, rubbing my hands together every night at the thought of one day doing what I was going to do here, dismantling and removing the pillager tower from the face of the earth. Sorry, I mean the face of my earth. That's right, this land is mine, and it has no business being here. Pillagers desperately tried to stop me, but it was all in vain. Their attacks were mere tickles, and my retaliation meant death. Once the land had been rid of that atrocity, I could then work on removing the land itself. Now that I know the dimensions up here on the surface, I'll be able to methodically work my way down to my beacon below. I'm not sure how long it will take, my prediction is most of the remaining days of this video. I could be wrong, but there are a lot of blocks to remove. I'm just grateful I've got amazing tools and a beacon, and if I didn't have those things, I would have either gone and got them before tackling this project, or set fire to my computer in frustration. I wasn't sure what sort of necromancy this was, but fucking pillagers were still spawning. Their presence in this land was supposed to have been ridden. I don't know how their spawning mechanics work, I assume they stop spawning once their tower, their place of refuge was gone. I guess I was wrong. I didn't bank on them being like cockroaches. And the thing about cockroaches is that they're resilient to death, so while I'm confident there are no pillagers at all at the moment, I'm not confident it will remain like that. Day 363, and it was time to have a break from renovation, not because I needed the break, but because my four netherite pickaxes and four netherite shovels were at their breaking point, so I'd need to go repair them. My house storage system is already overflowing with stone blocks and dirt, and now I have all of these chests to store there, plus I'm not even finished, there's going to be way more adding up. I've got a feeling I'm going to need to go end busting, as people say. I am starting to see a light at the end of the tunnel, or should I say the sky, because I've broken through parts of the cave ceiling. As far as on the surface goes, I'd removed a lot of blocks, my biceps and triceps are completely shredded. I'm like a blocky version of Chris Bumstead. There's still a lot of terrain to remove, but I'm confident the halfway mark has been breached, at least in terms of removing blocks. 
I've still got to put in melons and such, but just as a HR manager would say to a tricky question, we cross that bridge when we come to it. Maybe the next time I have a huge project that requires me to remove a huge portion of terrain, we'll do it with TNT. Day 364, I killed Enderman to repair my tools, and it really didn't take long to get the eight netherite tools back into tip-top condition. If I'd done this at the mob spawner, it would have taken four times as long. For the rest of the day, I killed Enderman for fun. There's something extremely satisfying about the power dynamic, and also to make it look like I'm a better Minecraft player than I actually am, because we all know a higher level equates to game incompetence. Already I need a way to get rid of enderpose, the storage is overflowing, these are all the enderpose I've automatically picked up simply from using the farm the few times I have. Tools repaired, it was back to the overworld, I took out a load of my shulkers from my ender chest for convenience, there's often something I need like torches, melons, food, wood, tools, etc. And then it was back to the sigma grind, I was beginning to open up a sizeable hoe in the cave ceiling. As far as I was concerned, this was a good sign of progress. From days 366 to 371, they all blended together they were all the same, removing blocks from the terrain to clear it out and make way for melons. The process itself should have been more boring than it was, but there's something about insta-mining blocks that is almost addictive. I don't need to think, I can chill quietly in front of my monitor and just go into autopilot. Even with a beacon and powerhouse tool, it was taking a surprising amount of time. How long was this supposed to take? I don't know, but I was chill about it. Until day 372, because that was the last day I could take of this. Uh, I was chill, but I was, um, I was starting to get bored and while yes I could continue to push myself like I said I was starting to get bored so when all of my pickaxes came close to their breaking point I stopped before I reached mine here's where I'm up to I'm making good progress much of the cave had been uncovered and it won't be long until I'm renovating the space with melons however I'm going to be giving this a break for the time being We've been doing this for, what, 40-ish days? I can come back to it in the next 100 days. The view from here is a lot easier to get a look at the scale, but to say I've been doing it for as long as I have, I, I feel like I should be further than I am. Other Minecrafters seem to be able to mine out multiple chunks down to bedrock in a single sitting, or maybe that's just the power of editing. One thing eating at me while I'd been removing blocks was that I'd only got one pick with Silk Touch. Do you know how annoying it is to only have one Silk Touch pick to pick up your ender chest? With the amount of level I had, I could put Silk Touch onto my non-Silk Touch picks without the need for grinding. The only grinding came from the Enderman farm, and I could hardly call it grinding, the speed in which it works. Before I headed back, I needed obsidian for more ender chests. They're useful to have, and having multiple dotted around my world would be really convenient. I know it's lazy, but not having to keep taking out my personal one out of my inventory when there's one nearby is a small quality of life addition that will make a big difference to my mental well-being. Day 374, I was in the nether gathering blaze rods for the other part of the ender chest recipe. I'm pretty sure by keeping my S tier looting 3 sword in my off hand, killing the blazes with a bow would still activate the looting 3 ability. The zombified piglins reminded me of a rabbit I used to have as a child. Whatever you were doing, it would always be in the way. Great rabbit, everyone loved him, but he had a knack of appearing where you didn't want him to appear. More often than not, in the centre of a Monopoly game we'd often play. He was like Godzilla to those little red hotels. So it was only a matter of time before I accidentally shot one of those zombified piglins with an arrow. And after that, I had to kill them all. I, I will just add that <laughs> that's where the parallel ends. We never actually shot our rabbit with an arrow. I left with only 11 blaze rods but it was more than enough for the amount of ender chest I was wanting to make. I'm thinking about putting glass walls along the sides of my nether road to stop these fat flying squids from seeing me and blowing up my beautiful melons. But like most things I think of, that will be for another time. The ender chests I made went to various locations around the world. By my beacon, at the terraforming site, at the iron farm, inside the trade cave, inside the nether at the lava collection zone, the nether fortress along a section of nether road, at the stronghold portal, in the portal room at the stronghold, by the end gate home in the end, at the Enderman farm, at both ends of the ice road, inside the collection chamber at the cactus farm, and at the base of my second staircase up to the ice road. Now, I know I said I wasn't going to do any more work at the cactus farm for a while, but my lizard brain couldn't think of anything else to do. I crafted a load of green stained glass to act as the outer shell as it were for the cactus farm, and I didn't realise how much more green dye I had than needed. Six and a half shulkers of green stained glass, I was confident I had enough. Day 300 my hope was that this wouldn't take 20 days to do. 
Once you get to this point in a 100 days video, time seems to start speeding up, and it didn't help that phantoms had come to mess things up for me. I will mention now that Future Juice knows that I can go to sleep, then get up immediately before the night phase is skipped, and the phantom counter is reset. Another thing I'd learned from a few of you guys, which is why it's painful for me to watch myself sleep the night away knowing what I know now. Even so, it is what it is. At the rate I'm placing glass, another three days of work, including today, I should have it finished. A lot better than the 20 I feared. Should be in the key word, I mean, if it takes four or five days instead, I'm not going to lose sleep over it. By the third day of placing glass around the farm, I was confident I'd get it finished that same day. And that prophetic prediction was right. All the glass was placed, I'd like the slime effect of the darker main body of the middle and the outer lighter green layer on the surface. It's professional. Now, some would say because I haven't extended the green glass over the top of the farm to create a roof. It's not actually finished, but there's a reason I've left it like this. In case I want to add further layers to the farm in the future. Crazy? Yes, but I like having the option open. The next day, my mind had thought up another project to start. What in this world is more evil than evil itself? What things shouldn't exist? What name, when said, triggers an anaphylactic shock to course through the very core of who I am? Pumpkins. Vile, disgusting crops the world needs to be rid of. So, what is it I'm doing? Something I should have done in the first 100 days of this series. Building a pumpkin incinerator. Once the shape was made, I wanted to use red terracotta over red wool for the interior of the incinerator because I'm fairly certain wool is flammable. I figured the best bet I'd have of finding a Badlands biome would be in a warmer climate, say, near to a certain desert I may have visited once or twice, and if by luck, and when I say luck I mean deductive reasoning, I found a Badlands biome. Perfect for a bad boy like me, as all bad boys typically say. My focus, as I said yesterday, was the red terracotta. It was a lighter shade of red than I'd expected, and I wasn't certain and if I liked it, but once I began to line the interior walls with the stuff, I liked it a lot more. The final part of the incinerator was lava, the molten solution to my pumpkin problem. Day 382. I don't know where the day went because all I did was place lava in the base of the incinerator, and that now meant I had a way to extinguish the orange crop forever. But as far as I was concerned, I wasn't done. No, I needed to do more. I needed redstone for making an auto pumpkin farm. Yes, I know that might sound like taboo, especially after denouncing it as much as I have, but there is a good reason for this, a great reason in fact. I'm going to be going with the same design as the auto melon farm I made in the first 100 days, so I spent a lot of the day gathering materials, pistons, observers, that sort of stuff, and yes, before anyone asks, I do have plans for a giant auto melon farm. That's going to be a massive project though, for the scale of what I've got in mind. As for the auto pumpkin farm and why I'm building it, it's simply so I can produce pumpkins that are going to be fed into the incinerator. That's its entire purpose. I'm building it on top of the incinerator. All pumpkins are going to be pushed down into the molten lava. Thinking about it fills my body with a thrill. And that emotion drove me to build. It was like orchestrating a symphony of euphoria. Everything was coming together nicely. Here's a look at the farm so far. It's not finished. There's still the pumpkin seeds to put in, the farm to be lit up and glass to be put around. But the main part is done. Now, surprisingly, I hadn't any pumpkins in my home storage system. Wonder why that is. But being the lower tier crop that they are, they're fairly common to find, and in fact within a minute, or maybe even less, I'd found a couple of patches. All of them I converted into seeds to plant into the farm, and I bone moved them so full grown pumpkins could be produced ASAP. The sooner we get those demonic crops burning, the better I'll be sleeping. The torches are so they continue to grow during the night time, and so I can properly see what's going on in the farm. There was a minor design disaster, I had needed to fix a tiny part of the farm during the pumpkin planting, a redstone issue. You know how these things go, and as a result water spilled down onto the lava and turned mostly all of it to obsidian, so now I needed to mine the obsidian, then refill the lava. Day 388, again back to work on the lava, I went again. I downed a potion of fire res for that sweet, sweet feeling of crapulence. Even in my intoxicated condition, I could appreciate the work I'd done, a fully functioning pumpkin farm that would produce pumpkins and and push them into the fiery depth of my incinerator. Every day and night from now until forever, pumpkins would be wailing and gnashing their teeth. All that was left was to cover the back of the farm with a block more suitable for my eyes. And there was only one block that came to mind. And no, in case any of you were thinking I'd use pumpkins to visually show it's an auto pumpkin farm, are you out of your fucking minds? Okay, and here it is. 
not only fully functioning but also fully finished and it's beautiful you know what isn't finished my base area i mean when you look at it my melon floor has been placed in an l formation at the edge of the terrain with my melon farm in the water but really i want my melon farm to be at the very heart of my base and the rest of the base around my farm and so to do that i was going to need to expand the base it would take an exorbitant amount of melons but it would be worth it i worked on the inner perimeter of the expansion the part of the base that would be near to the melon farm and here you can see those inner perimeter dimensions then it was to work out the dimensions of the outer perimeter of the place i needed to double back a few times and do some block counting to ensure i got the spacing right though being off by a block or two wouldn't be the end of the world as long as the base around the melon farm looks uniform and symmetrical in size it's fine and because it was the outer perimeter it took a bit longer to work out not to mention I had to work through some of the terrain, but it did get done. All I needed to do now was fill the space with melons, and we will have vastly expanded the base area. It might even rival the cactus farm when it's done. But there ain't no way I'm getting it done before the end of this video, so I turn to another job that I most likely won't be able to finish before the 400 days are up or so. And that was to finish the third layer of the melon farm. And impeccably timed, I had not a single block of dirt remaining to my name, so now it's looking very unlikely we're going to get it done before the video ends. But I'm going to try, and it at least gives me something to do up until day 400. I've got a lot of things I want to do in this series, but nothing I want to make a start on 8 days away from finishing this video. That's just me being fussy. Day 393, I still had dirt from yesterday, but I wouldn't have enough to finish the third layer, so I figured while it was still daylight, I'd get more. And then when the daylight went away, I spent all of my time getting those dirt blocks in place. They were finished being placed on day 394. The biggest chunk of the work was done. Putting in the dirt takes so long. Even with the dirt being placed, with only a few days remaining and so much still to do, I wasn't confident I'd get it finished. I had to get the base of the trenches put in place so the water wouldn't spill down into the layers below. I did what a few of you suggested in the comments of the previous videos, to toggle the shift key so I don't have to glue my pinky finger to the keyboard, and it was actually really nice. Like with the dirt though, I ran out of wood when I hadn't much time to spare, so I needed to take a trip to the local forest. On a positive, I'm going to have to remove a lot of these trees for when I expand the base area, so I'm hoping future me slightly. Wood collected, I spent the day placing planks in the trenches. Day 397, the trenches were now ready for the water. If I remember rightly, my hand was cramping up the last time. I did this. Not this time. I'm a stronger, fitter Minecrafter than back then. Day 398, I managed to get onto placing the trapdoors that the torches were to sit on. At this point in time, I was wondering if maybe, just maybe, I'd be able to get the farm layer done by the end of day 400. But once the torch placing had extended into day 399, I knew for a fact it wasn't going to happen. Don't get me wrong, it's going to be close, but not close enough. When hoeing the ground, I tried experimenting with running, but I kept missing a few dirt blocks here and there, so I went back to sidestepping. I think on average it worked out around the same speed. Day 400. Here it is, the final day. Usually at this time of the video I'm using the last day to rest, but I'm a man on a mission and I'm at least going to get the farm fully honed, which I did and then began planting seeds. But at the speed I was planting them, there were too many seeds and not enough days, so I planted what was in my inventory and opted not to continue. If I had another day or two, then yeah, I'd get it done, but there's no time left. Without the melons in place, I feel like you can kind of see the scale of the farm a lot better. And don't forget, this is the third layer, so the overall farm size is true triple this. There's a lot of melons we're going to be getting from this. One day I'll have an auto melon farm that produces way more melons than this. I didn't go into this series wanting the biggest melon farm in Minecraft, but now I'm starting to get curious where we place in comparison to others. But that's it for this video. Thanks to everyone who likes and subscribes, it really helps out a lot. If you want to support me on Patreon, then the link's going to be in the description. Anyway, I'm going to see you next time. Alright, bye.